Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the drug treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we're continuing our discussion of the immunosuppressant drugs. Okay, so the next drug I want to discuss is a drug called rituximab. Okay, and this is again a uh, monoclonal antibody drug. And this time, this drug rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that is directed against a protein uh, called CD20. Okay, so CD20 is a protein that is often used as a B cell marker. Okay, and it's because CD20 is on the surface of B cells. So let me show this here. So let's say this protein here is a CD20 protein, standing for cluster of differentiation 20. Okay, and it's on the surface of B cells and also B cell derivatives such as uh, plasma, um, plasmocytes, uh, sorry, plasma blasts and um, plasma cells. Okay, so uh, this monoclonal antibody rituximab will bind to CD20 molecules on the surface of B cells and also on the surface of plasma cells, okay, which remember the cells which are actually secreting antibody. So let's say we have it here. And plasma cells have this much more oval shape because they have a large uh, space here for the um, production of antibodies, whereas the B cells don't need that. They just have a massive great nucleus. Okay, so again, there is a CD20 molecule on the surface of plasma cells. Okay, so basically what will happen is if you administer this drug, rituximab, the rituximab will bind to the CD20 molecules on the surface of the B cells or plasma cells. And then, what does this do? Well, basically, it's going to lead to the destruction of the B cells and plasma cells. And the way it does this is because now, what have you got effectively on the surface of these cells? You've got a molecule here, which we could view as the antigen, and then we've got an antibody. Now, what happens when you get uh, antigen-antibody complexes like this on the surface of cells? Well, that's usually what would happen in an adaptive immune response against a pathogen. Usually, what you would do is you'd have some pathogen here. Okay, so let's say this is some little bacterium here. So, it's some pathogen. And the pathogen would have... Uh, antigens on its surface and you launch uh, humor adaptive immune responses against uh, these antigens and you'd produce antibodies that would bind uh, to those antigens, okay? And now uh, this antibody is going to lead to the destruction of the pathogen uh, that it's bound to the surface of. Now how does it do that? Well, uh, there are me multiple mechanisms. So for instance, one of the mechanisms by which it leads to the destruction is for a process known as opsonization. Okay, so opsonization. Right, okay, so uh, in the process of opsonization, what happens is that basically if you've got an immune complex on your surface, it means that you are more likely to be phagocytosed uh, by a phagocyte. Okay, so let me show a phagocyte over here. So, basically, phagocytes, such as macrophages or neutrophils, in order for them to actually phagocytose a pathogen, what has to happen is initially they have to bind to a molecule that's on the surface of a pathogen. So they have to recognize some molecule on the surface of the pathogen that says, phagocytose me, basically. I'm not a good thing to have around. You need to destroy me. Okay, and one of the key things that does this is if you've got uh, antibody molecules on your surface. So basically, if you've got antibody molecules on your surface, the uh, phagocyte over here will have um, receptors for those antibody molecules. And now I've drawn one big single lobe nucleus, so this is a macrophage rather than a neutrophil, since neutrophils would have uh, multi lobe nuclei. Okay, but anyway, uh, the process would be similar for neutrophils. What will happen is the uh, phagocyte will have a receptor for the uh, FC region of this antibody. The antibody will therefore bind to this receptor, and that will trigger phagocytosis of this pathogen. So what will happen is the phagocyte will engulf the pathogen into a vesicle, uh, called a phagosome, a specialized vesicle that's within the cytoplasm of the phagocyte, uh, called a phagosome. Okay, so here is the pathogen now engulfed, 
And then what will happen is other little vesicles over here, which are called lysosomes, uh, will then come and fuse with the phagosome. And these lysosomes uh, contain uh, lytic enzymes called lysozymes, uh, which uh, will break down the pathogen, basically. So when you fuse these lysosomes with the phagosome, they'll release their horrible enzymes onto the pathogen, and the pathogen will be broken down. Okay, so opsonization is a fancy word to mean it increases your chance of being phagocytosed, basically. In addition, when you've got immune complexes on your surface, it will also activate the classical complement cascade, okay, uh, which will result in the formation of membrane attack complexes, okay, which will cause osmotic lysis of the pathogen, and also uh, the classical complement cascade will further cover the pathogen in C3B molecules, which is another very potent opsonin, which is the name for any molecule which participates in opsonization, i.e. a molecule that makes you more likely to be phagocytosed. So, basically, having an immune complex on your surface predisposes you to be destroyed by the uh, immune system, basically. So, these B cells and plasma cells, then, are going to be destroyed by uh, the immune system when you give this drug rituximab, which binds to the CD20 on their surface. And the great thing about this is that CD20 is a B cell or plasma cell marker, okay, so it's not on other cells. So, this will selectively destroy B cells and plasma cells. And of course, if you destroy all of your B cells and all of your plasma cells, then there are no cells to produce antibody anymore. So, you don't produce any antibody. And if you don't produce any antibody, then you don't get the uh, immune complexes forming within the synovial membrane. And remember, it is these immune complexes which cause the inflammation. Okay, so it's this continual production of new immune complexes that maintains the chronic inflammation inflammation that you see within uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so rituximab is a very powerful immunosuppressant that will block the production of antibodies, basically. Right, so we're now going to look at two other uh, immunosuppressants, okay, which are both going to work by blocking cell division. Okay, and these two immunosuppressants that we're going to examine now are azathioprine, okay, and uh, mycophenolate. Okay, so basically, in the activation of the adaptive immune response, we've seen that you need a lot of cell division. So, for instance, when you first activate the CD4 positive naive T cell, it then differentiates into a T helper naught cell and then proliferates into a whole population of T helper naught cells. Okay, so it must divide basically because one T helper naught cell isn't going to be able to do much basically. You need a whole population of them. In addition, when you activate B cells, uh, again the B cell proliferates and then undergoes somatic hypermutation. So all of its daughter cells undergo slight mutations in their B cell receptors, remember. Okay, and if it doesn't proliferate, and then, of course, you can't produce a population of B cells. Uh, you can't get, firstly, you can't get the affinity maturation occurring because that relies on a population with uh, varied B cell receptors. But also, you can't really produce many plasma cells because the most you could ever produce is a single plasma cell from that single B cell. And that's not going to be able to produce that much antibody, okay? So, Proliferation is an extremely important part of the adaptive immune response, and if you stop proliferation, uh, you can stop the adaptive immune response, and that's how these two drugs are going to work. Now, you might think, well, if these two drugs stop proliferation, surely they're extremely powerful anti-cancer chemotherapies, and anti-cancer chemotherapies, you know, they're famous for being horrible, horrible drugs that cause horrible, horrible side effects. Okay, but what's special about these two drugs is that they have a certain amount of specificity for stopping proliferation within B and T lymphocytes and won't produce as much uh, reduction in proliferation in other cell types. So that's why these two drugs are special and why we don't just use any old anti-cancer chemotherapy. And obviously one of the main side effects of anti-cancer chemotherapy is that it produces immunosuppression because it stops proliferation in 
you know, some of the old drugs stop proliferation in all cells, okay, uh, and that will include the TMB lymphocytes, and therefore one of the key side effects of them is that it produces immunosuppression. Okay, but these two drugs are special because they have some specificity to B and T lymphocytes, and therefore you can reduce the number of side effects that you're going to have by uh, giving a drug that has an anti-proliferative effect. Okay, so we will start off with azathioprine, okay, but they're both going to have very similar mechanisms. So, in order to understand uh, the mechanism of azathioprine and mycophenolate, we need to understand the way that you copy DNA, okay, the way that you replicate DNA, and also the way that you produce mRNA, which is complementary to DNA, basically, the way that you transcribe the DNA. So we need to understand DNA replication and also transcription. Right, so um, let's start with the structure of DNA. Okay, so we'll draw cartoons initially rather than uh, actual uh, molecular diagrams, but we'll quickly go over to the molecular diagrams. Okay, so we'll start with a cartoon for the structure of DNA. So, DNA consists of nucleotides, okay? And I'll explain what a nucleotide is in a moment. In fact, I'll explain what a nucleotide is at the m now. So, a nucleotide is the name for a ribose sugar with a uh, organic base over here, okay, and with a certain number of phosphate groups over here. And I want to stress that it is not the name specifically for just one phosphate group, okay? So let me give you some other terminology as well, because it will help us understand this. So let's also look at the word nucleoside, okay? So, a nucleoside means a ribose sugar here, okay, um, so it also has a fifth carbon up there, with an organic base here, okay, so this is the organic base, so I might just put base here. So, a nucleoside means ribose plus the organic base, okay, uh, now, you're not going to use ribose in DNA, okay? So there are also uh, deoxynucleosides, okay? Which means uh, deoxyribose plus an organic base. And of course, it's deoxyribose that you use uh, within DNA. Okay, so a nucleoside is deoxyribose uh, uh, plus an organic base. And the difference between deoxyribose and ribose is that ribose will have an alcohol group coming off this second carbon down here, whereas deoxyribose will not. Okay. Now, I also just want to add, what are the organic bases? Well, there are quite a few organic bases. The main ones are uh, guanine, which is often abbreviated to G. Okay. Um, then there's um, cytosine, which is often abbreviated to C. Okay, then there's thymine, which is often abbreviated to T. Okay, there's adenine, which is often abbreviated to A. Okay, and finally, another one that's used in um, RNA, there's uracil, which is often abbreviated to U. Okay, but we'll see a few more organic bases in our discussion of azathioprine and mycophenolate. So we'll see things like hypoxanthine and xanthine as well uh, in our discussions. Okay, but these are the ones that are actually used in DNA and RNA. So guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine are used uh, within uh, DNA, and guanine, adenine, cytosine, and uracil are used in RNA. Okay, uh, right. So. A nuclear side, then, where you have this S here, means a uh, organic base with a ribose sugar. A deoxynuclear side then means a deoxyribose sugar with an organic base. Now, what does a nucleotide then mean? Well, a nucleotide means a nuclear side with some phosphate groups stuck on it. Okay, so remember a nucleoside was ribose plus an organic base, and then we're going to add on some phosphate groups, and we're not necessarily just going to add on one phosphate group. 
what I've drawn here, we've only added one phosphate group on. I've just drawn this uh, um, single ball here to represent a phosphate group. Okay, and when you have a nucleoside like this with a single phosphate group on, okay, and that will be considered a nucleotide, it would st strictly speaking be called a nucleoside monophosphate. Okay, so when you take a nucleoside and add on a single phosphate group, it's called a nucleoside monophosphate. Okay, and my pen's going, so I'm going to call it there for this video, and we'll continue our discussion in the next video.